Stay all day. Now tuned in to the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you to use those of personal initiative, which is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself. Yes, you. To go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. Then we put all this together into one bundle, one package, one mindset, one method, one philosophy, one approach. Wrote a book on the subject and we have this daily masterclass that is called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. In today's topic, we are talking why college athletes should not, yes, you heard me correctly, should not be paid. And I'm going to lay out, lay this all out point by point, step by step, so you fully understand it. So please make sure you're listening to the context of how I'm making this argument here today. Now, the reason that this topic is even up is because just uh, the other day from when I'm recording this, I was on a different show. I was on a show called The Soul of Enterprise with uh, Ron and Dan. And one of them actually asked me this question because they knew my background was in sports. The, their show is about you no know, business. We were talking you no know, personal growth, personal development, things like that. But since my background is in sports, they asked me this question, should college athletes be paid? And I gave my answer, and this is an answer that I did give. I made a video talking about this probably maybe three or four years ago on YouTube, but I realized I had never actually talked about it here on this show, my master class. So I said that it would be perfect for me to lay this out here. And I think I've gotten better at articulating since you know, three years ago. So I think I can make an even better version of my answer right here. Even though my answer has not changed much, I think I can explain it a lot better here today. So today I'm going to tell you why. And any of you who don't know uh, what this conversation is, why it even comes up, for those of you who don't know, uh, in college sports, we're talking specifically in the United States to so the NCAA, that these top college teams, their players do not get paid. Technically, when you play NCAA sports, you are technically an amateur. You are offic officially uh, noted as an amateur, and amateurs do not get paid for their work. If you want to get paid for your work, you become a professional. And once you get paid, now you have no am no more amateur eligibility. Therefore, you cannot play in the NCAA. So this is why you may see an NCAA player if they're accused of receiving quote improper benefits close quote. In other words, that means them getting paid based on their ability as an athlete. They are no longer an amateur, thus ineligible to play NCAA sports. So basically the rules that the NCAA has set up makes you ineligible to play college sports if you are receiving money. So if you receive money, then you can't play college sports. And if you play college sports, you're not allowed to receive money. It's a great system for them because they don't have to pay the, the labor force, which are the players. And there are a lot of different arguments around this, how you could even call the players labor because they are technically, as the designation goes, student athletes. They're students who happen to play sports, not athletes who happen to be students. And this is a way that it, it's worded that helps kind of shield the NCAA in some ways, but there are a ton of arguments around all of that. Today, we are not arguing the semantics of student athletes. We are not arguing the, the legalities of whether you call them uh, labor force workers as playing as athletes or if they're actually students. We're not arguing the tax exempt status that the NCAA has and the money that they make overall on the backs of these athletes performing the way they do. What we're arguing right here today is why I'm saying athletes should not be paid. And again, those of you who know anything about me, and if you don't, I'll tell you right now, I am a former NCAA athlete. I was not paid. I played at the Division Three level, albeit, but I was not paid at all. I never received any improper benefits based on my ability to perform on the court. And if I had, I don't think anybody would have cared anyway, because it wasn't anybody chasing us around to make sure that we weren't receiving any benefits. So the argument has been for years, it's been, hey, the NCAA makes a ton of money off of specifically the revenue generating sports, which are basketball and football. And if we put them in order, it would be football, then basketball. Football generates the most revenue of college sports. Basketball is second, and then everything. Basketball is a distant second to football. And then everything else is a distant third and whatever after football and basketball. So those are the two sports that generate the most money. This has always been a big issue because those sports are heavily populated by African-American males. We're talking specifically, there aren't any women college football teams, at least not that I know of, and if there are, they ain't generating any revenue. And then in basketball, you have the men's uh, basketball tournament, also known as March Madness or the NCAA tournament. That generates a ton of money. 
The women's tournament generates some money, but not anywhere close to what the men's tournament generates. So usually it's young black males who are the ones who are producing the revenue through their performance, but they are by, by law and by the rules of the NCAA not allowed to earn a single dime based on their ability to perform on the field or on the court. Again, specifically talking football and basketball. So with the whole conversation of, or the whole concept of social justice, which some people think is a new thing, is not a new thing, it's been going on. People have been talking about this concept for 60 plus years, but it gets, it flames up again. <coughs> it flames up again every now and then. And in the world these days, people are talking about it again. And every year when football season is going on, maybe a player says something or a player has a, a bowl game coming up in football and football season ends in usually late November, early December. Then there's a whole month break and then the bowl games are in late December, early January. Nowadays, you have players sometimes who will choose to not participate in the bowl game so as to not get injured and hurt their status for becoming a professional playing in the NFL and making a lot of money. So though in those situations, the conversation comes up with basketball players who complain that they have to, right now there's the one and done rule, and that's not the official name of it, but basically the NBA has a rule that you are not allowed to be drafted into the NBA. You can't even enter the NBA draft unless you are at least one year removed from high school. So without any recourse, the players have to do something for that one year after they graduate from high school. Most of them choose to go play college basketball, and then the ones who are really that talented, they leave after just one year, and then they get to go play or at least hope to play in the NBA. Whereas it wasn't that long ago where you could just go straight from high school to the NBA. You have famous names, Kevin Garnett, Kobe Bryant, Tracy McGrady, LeBron James, Dwight Howard. These are all players who have done this. But after a certain point, I think the last one and done year was either 2004 or 2005, one of those years. That was the year Dwight Howard came out in 2004, LeBron right before him in 2003. And there is buzz that the NBA may change that rule yet again to where high school players can go straight from high school to the NBA. But whenever that conversation comes up, people bring up the point like, hey, in these sports that are populated by young African-American men, there are these rules where the players have to go to the NCAA or they have to do something after that one year. And the best option for the most part, the one that gets taken the most is going and playing for the NCAA, but they're not allowed to be paid by the NCAA. So the NCAA basically exploiting these kids making money off their backs and the kids are by rule not allowed to make any money and in football by the way and this one doesn't get talked about as much because there is some justification to it coming out of high school you had to be three years removed from high school to enter the nfl draft so this is why you don't there's no one and done in football it's not even two and done you have to play or at least be out of high school for three years before you are allowed to enter the nfl draft and one justification for that, that I don't see people challenging that often, is that the physicality of the NFL and just how big and strong the players are, it makes sense that players need to go to college for three years so they can get into that strength training program and kind of build their bodies up. Whereas in basketball, that's not really a concern. But either way, you have these years of these players having their talents uh, leveraged by the NCAA, by their coaching staffs, by the schools, by the conferences, Everybody is making money except the people who are actually out on the court and on the field playing. So college athletes deserve to be paid. This is the argue. This is how the argument goes. Today, I'm going to argue the opposite, that they do not deserve to be paid. And I wanted to explain why and my reasons for college athletes not being paid are not going to be the same as what you hear from other people. So let me knock a couple of those out right now. So just in case you thought I was going to make those arguments, I'm absolutely not. One of them being that while the players are paid because they are getting a scholarship and they're getting a free education, quote unquote, that is not one of the, that's something that is going to come up in this conversation, but that's not the reason why I'm saying that they shouldn't be paid. That has nothing to do with it. Are they getting a free education? Technically, I mean, technically it's not free. I mean, you're, they're playing. If you stop playing, then you no longer have a scholarship. So technically it's not free. The exchange is the education in exchange for you participating in on the field. So some people say, well, that's good enough. I say, yeah, I think there's a there's plenty of argument in different directions for that. And at the same time, we would also have to, even if the conversation of players getting paid does come in, we would also have to factor in, well, what about the superstar player who's drawing all the fans to the stadium versus the player at the end of the bench who barely plays? Should they be both making the same amount of money? If it does come to the point that athletes are getting paid, that's a different conversation for a different day. But I wanted to make sure I knock out that one 
common objection of college athletes getting paid that is not the objection that I'm giving here today. All that said, let's get into point number one. Topic once again is why college athletes should not be paid. First, I'm going to give you the practical and logical point, as I want to use a lot of practical and logical points here on the show. In episode number 915, I told you that there are three ways to make money, and there are basically three levels to this shit when it comes to earning money in life. Everyone who's listening to me right now, you are at, right now, and what you do, you are at one of these three levels, guaranteed. Level one is you accept what is offered to you. This is like when I worked at McDonald's as a senior in high school. I went to the interview, they hired me for the job, then they told me how much I was getting paid. I said, uh, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, whoever it was that hired me, thank you for the job opportunity. I accepted it. I had no leverage. I couldn't demand anything more. I wasn't in a position to negotiate, so I just accepted what they offered me, which was whatever, whatever it was, $5.25 an hour. That's the first level of earning money. The second level of earning money is negotiation. You make an offer, they make an offer, you go back and forth, there's some push and some shove, and finally, at some point, hopefully, you come to a compromise. You are able to negotiate when you have some leverage. The number one thing you need in any negotiation is leverage. So if you have no leverage, you are not in a position to negotiate, i.e., you are at the first level, which is acceptance. So any of you who's ever been able to negotiate how much money you made doing anything, you are at the second level of earning money. The third level of earning money is what we call demanding. And demanding is just as it sounds. You tell people what the price is, they either meet it or they go the opposite direction. You either do what, you either give me what I'm telling you I want or you go somewhere else. If you were to hire Rihanna to come sing at your birthday party, it's not, it's not a negotiation. You're not gonna go back and forth with her team about how much you have to offer and how much she should accept. They're just gonna, they're gonna give you a take it or leave it. There is no acceptance. You don't tell her, hey, we got $250 budgeted for a singer. You, can you come do this? That's not gonna happen. They're not even taking your call. They're gonna tell you the price. They're gonna tell you the availability. They're gonna tell you what Rihanna will and will not do. And you either meet their price or you go find somebody else to sing at your party. That is the level of demanding. That's the third level. So as I just told you, there's levels to this shit when it comes to making money. So anyone who's listening to this right now, uh, if you've never heard that episode, as again, it's episode 915. All these, every episode that I reference in every episode of the show will be listed below in the show notes. So if you just scroll down wherever you're listening to this, you'll see a link to episode 915. You can go listen to it, to your, listen to it yourself right now so you understand that there are levels to this shit. Now, I'm explaining that to tell you this. When you are a scholarship athlete playing college sports, and again, we're talking specifically football and basketball, but every other sport as well, because the other sports are not generating enough revenue for any of them to be complaining about not getting paid anyway. So we're talking football and basketball, the ones who actually have a logical economic claim that they should actually make some of the money because there's plenty of money being generated. When you are a scholarship athlete, a scholarship, a college scholarship, athletic scholarship is a contract. It is a binding contract that you as an athlete you, you have an option of accepting or not accepting. Notice the language there. Accepting, three levels of earning money. Accept, negotiate, demand. You accept a college scholarship. And if you accept that scholarship, you cannot turn around. Well, actually you could, but it wouldn't make any sense, logically, for you to turn around after you accepted the scholarship and then complain about the offer that you just accepted. Now, the reason why I'm giving you that is to tell you this. If you're a college athlete on scholarship, you don't deserve to be paid because you have already accepted an offer that clearly says to you, when you accepted it, it says, we're going to give you free room and board. We're going to pay your tuition and maybe give you maybe a little bit of maybe some kind of stipend that you get, maybe a little, a couple of hours, not a lot, but a couple of hours for you to eat and things like that. Or maybe we'll provide you the food, whatever it's going to be. But the document says, the contract that you accept says, you will not be compensated specifically for your play. You're not going to be given a salary. Uh, we're going to give you these things, the things that it costs to go to school. We're going to cover that in exchange for you playing on the football or the basketball team, but you will not receive a, a salary. It says that on the scholarship. So if you accept that offer, then what sense does it make for you to turn around and say, well, I don't like this offer. I don't like this contract. I don't like this deal that I've agreed to. Well, why did you agree to the deal if you didn't think it was a good deal? If it's not a good deal, why are you accepting it in the first place? So college athletes should not be paid because the scholarship says you will not be paid. So if you don't like the deal, you do have options. All right, everybody has options in life. Here's the option if you don't like the deal. You can enter the open market and prove that you're worth it. Now, there are players who have done this. In the Again, back in the day, 20 years ago, you could just go straight from high school to the, to the NBA if you wanted to. Now, football is not the same, but... 
in basketball, if you didn't like the deal of college scholarships or you just thought you were good enough to get paid straight out of high school, you didn't have to go through that situation or worry about a scholarship. You could go straight to, let me just go straight to the NBA and see how much I'm worth in the open market. Let's see who drafts me. Let's see how I'll perform when I get out there on that court and I'll prove that I'm a pro or I'll be proven to not be at the professional level. These days with athletes, now you have a few other options. Now the G League has started to open up a program they call the G League Ignite program where they're basically taking players who would be top rated college freshmen, but instead they get to go play in the G League. They're given a salary. They're actually being paid as a professional athlete. They play a season in the G League. And then after that one year in the G League, they can enter the NBA draft and get drafted so they can basically start making money straight out of high school. Now that G League Ignite program, as of this season when I'm recording it, the 2000-2021 season, they only had one team for G League Ignite. So those teams, that G League Ignite team, had a few veteran players from around the world, like pro basketball veterans, and then it had a bunch of, not too many of them, but several high school players who were top rated, they could go play. So it's not like 300 high school players who go join the G League. It was like five or five guys, something like that. It was, wasn't a ton of people. Now, hopefully the G League over the years, I think they're looking to expand this program over time and put more resources into it to where maybe at some point they'll have a whole farm system to where players will have a choice, a real choice, between taking a college scholarship or going to play in the G League. But right now, it's only one team. Then you have players like, you look at somebody like LaMelo Ball, who right now is doing pretty well. He's injured as of this recording, but did pretty well his rookie season playing in the NBA. He didn't play in college basketball. He went and played overseas. He played in Australia in his last year before he entered the NBA draft, did okay in Australia, showed enough flashes of talent to where an NBA team took a chance on him, drafted him, and he did pretty well his rookie year in the NBA. So you can go overseas. Now I get a lot of players asking me, Dre, well, could I go, a high school player saying, well, I don't wanna play in college, could I just go play overseas first? And the thing is with somebody like Lamelo, also like with these players in the NBA G League Ignite, the players that you see taking these options to go straight from high school to getting paid to play basketball specifically, the football doesn't have these options, but for basketball specifically, these players are rated in the top, for the most part, the top 10 in their graduating class. Not even the top 50, but the top 10 in their graduating class. These are the kind of players that are taking these opportunities. So if you're not rated at that level, this opportunity is probably not going to be for you at least as of right now. Now, maybe 10 years from now, it will have expanded a little bit, but 10 years from now, uh, you're not gonna have the same opportunity because you're gonna be 10 years older. So in these places, you do have the option of going and doing this and you can allow the market to determine your value. So if you don't like the college scholarship offer and you wanna get paid to play basketball specifically, all right, don't take the college scholarship, put yourself in the overseas open market and the market will determine your value. The market will tell you what you're worth. So if you get an offer, then the market is telling you that you're worth something. If you get no offers, guess what the market is telling you? The market is telling you that you're not worth anything right now in the basketball, the professional basketball world. And this is just a cold, harsh reality of business. The market has spoken or not spoken and let you know exactly what you're worth. In the football world, I don't see too many football players saying, well, I'm not gonna take a college football scholarship. I'm gonna just go you know, overseas or play you know, overseas football. I don't see that happening too often. For the most part, with football players, they are funneling straight through the NCAA. And it seems as if, now I didn't play football, so it seems as if football players seem to have more of an inherent understanding of the necessity of going to college so they can get bigger, stronger, better in football. And maybe it's more of a direct translation between how somebody performs in college football and how they actually perform in uh, NFL life, maybe. Now, again, I'm not a football player, so I can't speak to that any more specifically than that. But the first point that I'm making here is the practical and logical thing is if you accept the scholarship that says you don't get paid, you can't complain about not getting paid because you accepted the offer. You don't have to accept it if you don't want to. But if you accept it, you can't complain about a contract that you just signed. It makes no sense. Point number two. Today's topic, once again, is why college athletes should not be paid. So now let's move on. Now that we got the logical part out the way, let's move on to the bigger picture argument of this whole conversation. Because the bigger picture is something that maybe many of you are already thinking. Maybe you've been thinking it since the very, the very beginning of this episode and you're hoping that I got to it. Is the money there? Is the money available for a football or basketball player to actually get paid playing their sport in college, especially if they're playing on a team that is actually producing revenue. Is that money there? The answer is, of course, yes, the money is there. The NCAA generates a ton of money. They don't pay taxes. 
the coaches make money, the conferences make money, the schools make plenty of money. Yes, the money is available if they want to get a player something. If you want to get them some kind of salary, I'm not saying they should be getting paid $10 million a year right there in the NBA, maybe not even 100000 but could you pay them something as a salary? Sure. As a college student, listen, when I was playing college basketball, if you would have given me and each of my teammates $1,000 a month, we would have been really happy because it was more than the zero that we were receiving at that time. You gave every college player $1,000 a month. I'm not doing the math on that. That's for somebody else who wants to dive deeper into the stats. But again, the reason I'm putting out the number $1,000 just as an example, it doesn't have to be some huge, unbelievable number. It doesn't have to be some kind of livable wage or anything like that because remember, all of their food, clothing, shelter is already paid for, not the clothing, but the food and shelter is already paid for for these players. So it's not like they have expenses. They don't have jobs. They're not, for the most part, don't have families. They're not raising kids. All you're doing is going to class and playing their sport. So is, the, is there money available that could possibly play, pay these players? Of course there is. Now, could the players get some of that money and everybody else who's already eating continue to eat? The answer is of course. But here's the thing. Why would people in power just give that power away by handing the athletes money? Why would the president of the NCAA or the people who run the conferences that these schools play in or even the coaches who coach these players? And I've heard coaches say, hey, they do think players should be paid, but it's not like they're, they're out there picking to take some money out of their own pockets and give it to the players. And I ain't mad at you coaches for that. I understand, I understand the predicament that you're kind of in because you work with the players on a day to day. But at the same time, you got to feed your own family and you accept the salary that you accepted. Why would people in power just give that money away? Give that power away by handing athletes money when they don't have to. Right now, the situation is set up that the players pay, play and do not receive a salary. So for, in order for the players to start receiving a salary, the, what's going to happen? What has to happen? Something has to happen there. All right, the people in power are not going to just say, you know what? We've been just getting all this money and you know, we're living pretty well. You know, I just added a second garage onto my house, just redid my kitchen, you know, sent my kids to private school. You know what? I'm going to just take some money out of my own salary and just start giving it to the players. That's not going to happen. All right? It doesn't happen in life. This is just human nature. People are not going to give away power unless they have to. So this is a trick question, the question that I just asked you. They will not give away power. College itself, and I'm stepping outside of talking about sports, I'm talking about college itself, in the United States, is a bubble. The reason there's a bubble is because the cost of college are rising faster than inflation, which means it costs more to go to college year over year than people actually have. There's more, there's more money that it costs. You have to spend more money to go to college then people actually have more money over a year to year basis. So there's less. So I think I explained that well enough. Inflation is basically just how much people have and how much people are spending and how much things cost. College costs are going up faster than inflation, which means eventually that bubble has to burst because people just won't be able to afford it. And then everything's going to come crashing down at some point. We don't know when, but at some point that's going to happen if costs of college continue to rise as they have over the last uh, couple of decades. It technically means, the reason why I'm bringing that up is to tell you this. Remember that college athletes are on scholarship, right? So in exchange for playing, they are receiving a free tuition. So the cost of going to school, even though it goes up every year, the players don't have to incur any of that cost. By playing, they get that cost written off. So technically, if I was arguing on behalf of the colleges, I would say, well, listen, you are actually being quote unquote paid more because every year, the price of education increases, but every year yours is free, tech, quote unquote free. Yours is paid for in exchange for you playing. So if college cost 20,000 last year, but it cost 21,000 this year, you got $20,000 worth of cash and prizes, so to speak, last year on scholarship. This year you're getting 21,000 worth of cash and prizes this year on scholarship. So the cost is going up, but you're not occurring any of that increased cost. We are taking care of it for you in exchange for you playing. So technically, that argument could be made and has been made by many people who are arguing on behalf of the universities why these players are not, quote unquote, being paid. They say, well, they are being paid because it costs money to go to school and that is being paid for. And this is technically correct. I want to be clear. That is technically correct. It does cost money to go to school. Nobody here goes to school for free. If you go to school, quote unquote, for free, you either you have some kind of grant or scholarship or something that was paying for it. Nothing in life is free. First of all, of economics is there's no such thing as a free lunch. So nobody's going anywhere for free, especially any college or university. So this is a fair and a true point. Now, again, let's remember athletes and those who advocate on their behalf. 
you accepted the deal that says you don't get paid. We, we're always going to come back to that. And that was the reason why it was the first point. If you accept an offer, you can't turn around and complain about the offer. All right? Don't accept it if you don't like it. But if you accepted it, then this is the deal. The NCAA, the conferences that schools play in, and the schools themselves, they take the money that is generated from football, mostly football and some basketball. They put that money in their own pockets. That's the salaries that people get paid. And people should get paid for their work. I'm not saying they shouldn't get paid at all. But some of that money could go to the players is the, is the conversation we're having here. They put that money in their own pockets. They take that money and they go construct buildings for you know, their uh, construct buildings on their campuses. Now I'm talking about the, the schools period here. I'm not just talking about sports. So when I say the money that they're taking in, this is not just money made from the football program or the basketball program. I'm talking about all the money. So all the students. So any college students right now, any parents listen to this who have students and who have kids in college, they don't play a sport, but you pay a bill for them to go to school. I'm talking to every dollar that that school takes in. They take this money and they pay the people who work on the campus and it is a job, so they should get paid. They build buildings and college campuses are for the most part beautiful places with beautiful buildings and nicely freshly manicured grass. They fund other non-revenue sports, like the sports that don't generate enough money to actually pay for their expenses. They fund non-revenue sports with the money made mostly from football and the basketball tournaments and the tuition fees. All right, that's how all this stuff gets paid for. So if you play a sport in college that does not generate revenue, if you're on the rowing team or the lacrosse team or the softball team or the gymnastics team or the wrestling team or the rugby team or the golf team, all right, your sport does not generate enough money to pay for that team to even exist. Maybe if you're a college athlete or if you were, maybe you already know that. All right, you should know that. That money comes from the football slash basketball teams or and or rather, because every school does this, and or it comes from the tuition of all students. So even as soon as you don't play on the golf team, you are subsidizing the golf team by even paying tuition, period. That's how it works in colleges in the United States, no matter what the school we're talking about. Some of those fees go towards the sports teams. And that's it's not necessarily wrong. I'm just giving you I'm just laying out the truth of what's happening here. I'm not here. I'm not going to argue every fine point of this because this conversation, somebody can write a whole book on this, honestly. So all that being said, it should also be noted that the prestige of a sports team draws students to a school, even when those students aren't playing the sport. They know they're not going to play the sport, but they still want to go. People go to Alabama because of the popularity of the football team, even though you're a girl and you're not even trying to play on the football team. But you want to go there because the football team is so popular. Or people go to Duke because the basketball team is so popular. Or you even think of Duke as a possibility for where you can go because you know about the basketball team. So the sports teams work as a kind of like a marketing tool for colleges and universities. And this is, I'm not saying this as a negative thing. This is just part of the game. This is part of the hustle. If you go to a school like Florida State, you go to University of Florida, USC, Texas, these schools, because they have very popular sports programs, they are able to draw students to come there who, are, who know they're not going to play a single minute of sports, but because of the popularity of those sports teams. Those things do matter, and it helps them market the school, bring more people in, raise the tuition and fees, and thusly they can build nicer campuses, more buildings, et cetera, et cetera, do all the other things they do on those beautiful college campuses. And college campuses are beautiful places. So people come there as students because they heard about, about the football team. They pay their tuition, pay money for the tickets, and the school makes more money. This is, the, this is the business. As for the actual data on each dollar, where it's going, where it will come from, and who it could go to, and how it could be divided up to make sense, again, that is a deep data dive that the person you're listening to, the host of this show, I'm not keen to be doing all that. I ain't got time for all that. But there are people who will do that. It's just not going to be me. Here, I make my arguments on, on more of a practical and logical basis than on a, a data and empirical evidence basis, just to be clear. So all that being said, let's move on to point number three. How can the players get paid? If you are a, an advocate of college athletes and you believe they should be paid, you want to know how could it actually happen? Let me give you an answer to the question. Leverage is how things happen in life. You want to make things happen, there has to be leverage. You can't make things happen with no leverage. So what does leverage do? Leverage takes you off of level one and puts you on level two. Level two is the level at which you can negotiate. When you can say to people, okay, this is what you are offering. Here's what we're offering. Now let's sit down at the table and have a conversation. And both sides are willing to have that conversation because they want to work together. They just haven't come to terms yet. 
Now, when you're at the level one of accepting, uh, you can't offer a negotiation. When I got hired at McDonald's, if I said, hey, I see you're offering me five twenty-five an hour, but I want, you no, know, I want eight dollars. They probably would have said, I didn't say this, but they probably would have said, um, no. And if you don't want to take this five twenty-five, that's fine, uh, Mr. Baldwin, you don't have to take the job, but somebody else is going to come in here in five minutes and they want the job flipping burgers and we'll give it to them for five twenty-five. So take it or leave it. And I'd have had no leverage, so I couldn't do that. So when you have leverage, you can bring people to the table to negotiate or maybe even get yourself to the third level, which is demand. If your leverage is high enough, you can demand. So for example, like I said, Rihanna, she has leverage in the fact that there's only one Rihanna, so she can demand that you pay her price because you can't get her anywhere else. You can get another burger flipper or a person to cook fries at McDonald's very easily, but you can't get another Rihanna. And that perception allows her to be in a position of demand. So players right now, college athletes who are on scholarship, guess how much leverage they have? Zero. <laughs> they have zero leverage. If they have leverage, then guess what? They wouldn't be at level one. Since they have no leverage, well, what actually let me back up. The reason they have no leverage is because they have no organization. There's no players union for college sports, especially scholarship athletes who are in revenue generating sports, basketball and football. They're not organized as so many of them who could get them organized and they leave, they come and go so quickly. I mean, the most you get is what four years to play your sport. It's hard to keep everyone organized and how do you even have leadership with that when you have people coming in and out and since none of them is making any money, who's going to fund anyone who's actually going to put time, effort and energy into this? So you see, it's a conundrum here that needs to be figured out. So an example of how they could actually do this, and this is a, a radical example, but I'm just throwing this example out there. I'm not even saying that they should do this, and I highly doubt it would ever happen, but hey, maybe one day it will, and I'll take credit for it. Let's just say on the first day of college football season, and I'm talking uh, FBS, the, the top tier college football teams, first game of the season for most of the teams, or whenever that first game is. The teams... And the players on all the teams, just the players, they don't come out of the locker room. And they're all in uniform as if they're about to go play. And when it's time to come out of the locker room, nobody moves. And the coaches are all uh, baffled. Everybody on TV is talking about it. It becomes breaking news. And the players say, listen, we're not playing in the game until we are getting paid. We are demanding that we be paid for our performance and the money that we bring in. And until that happens, we will not play a single game. You could do this the first day of the NCAA tournament, the first day of college basketball season, first day of football season, something like this. Again, this will have to be highly coordinated because you have so many players in so many places. Somebody has to get in touch with everybody, keep everyone on the same page and make sure everyone follows through. That's why I said I doubt this, this is something that could even be organized and kept quiet enough that it would actually be a surprise when it happens. It would be damn near impossible these days, especially with social media. But something like this, along these lines, where the, every team, all the schools say, we're not playing until we get paid. This, what would happen if that were to happen, even though it's far-fetched, the NCAA will come to the table really quick. And you have automatically jumped yourself from level one of accepting to level two of negotiating because they ain't got no choice. Because all of those coaches, all of those schools, all the conferences, all, all the NCAA does not make money if the games aren't happening. If there are no games happening, nobody's making any money. And if you hit people in their pockets to where they're not making money, they will negotiate and listen to what you have to say. Even if they don't do it, they'll at least listen. You, they'll at least hear you out and you can at least have a conversation. Now, the question is, can the players organize at that kind of level to do something like that? Is there somebody out there who can maybe fund or offer the resources to actually help the players make some kind of argument for getting paid? and then keep all the players organized. We're talking thousands of people between the ages of 18 and 22. Keep all these people on the same page. Keep them not leaking whatever is going on. Keep everyone on the same page and make sure that they remain steadfast as time ticks away and the time on their actual careers. Because a lot of the athletes, especially in football and basketball, go to college specifically because, listen, they wanna build up their resume so they can go to the NFL or to the NBA. Now, if you're not playing, you can't make yourself look good to the NFL or the NBA. So how long could this last? How long could they sit out? How long could they say, yo, y'all got to pay us or we're not doing our, we'll sit out the whole season unless you pay us. What guys thinking, I need this season so I can show myself for the league. How could that even work? Could that even work? Do they have the, would they even have the fortitude in the organization to make that happen? And would anybody even want to do it reasonably just thinking about it? So you can see the conundrum of how is this system ever going to change? 
I think one of the biggest opportunities for this to change is for outside no, outside organizations to offer some alternative to where people just stop taking the NCAA route. For example, like the NBA's G League, having the Ignite program where they take players that otherwise would have been you know, top recruits at colleges and instead they're going to the G League, getting paid and they get to play, play basketball like they wanted to do anyway, get some life skill training, whatever the G League is offering, and then go to the NBA draft like they wanted to anyway out of after high school, maybe after that one year or whatever. So as G League expands, that will give more opportunities to players, but you're talking how many schools at the, even at the D1 level, 300 plus schools, the G League ain't got that many teams. They don't have that kind of infrastructure. This would take years, this would take decades, maybe before they would have that whole system set up, maybe a decade, let's say, before they had enough of a system set up to where damn near any scholarship level athlete could do something like that in basketball. Now football, I don't know if there's any type of anybody even thinking of something, having something that works for that. So basketball, I mean, football players, I don't know what alternative you would have, but you are the ones that make it all the money. So really the organization for the, the, the sit-in and just saying we're not playing until we get paid, really would just be the football players because they generate four times the money that basketball generates anyway. So if football alone did this, it doesn't matter what basketball thinks, they could get this conversation to happen. But basketball, I think there will be some options coming up, but if you're... If you're an active basketball player right now, by the time the G League expands their program to the point that anyone could pretty much get in it who could get a scholarship, your basketball career will probably be over. So for right now, you might just have to see what the market is offering you. And if the market is not offering you anything, the open market, then hey, the market is telling you, is giving you a message loud and clear. And that's just what it is. So all that being said, let's recap today's class, which is why college athletes should not be paid. Point number one, I told you there's three levels of earning money, accepting, negotiating, and demanding. When you accept the college scholarship, you are at the acceptance level. The scholarship says you don't get a salary, so you don't get a salary. There's nothing to argue about. And if you don't like that offer, go to the open market and see what anybody else offers you. And if no one offers you anything, then the market is telling you something. You might as well go take that scholarship. Number two, the bigger picture question, is the money there? Of course the money is there. Yes, the players could get something. Again, it doesn't have to be a full salary. They're not, it's not like they're paying for food, clothing, shelter. Their food is paid for, their shelter is paid for, hopefully they already got some clothes. All right, it's not like they need a ton of money. You could give them something and everybody could still be eating. But the thing is, people don't just give away power for no reason. Even if you try to guilt them into it, they can just ignore you and not give away their power. I mean, we see this every single day in the world. And these schools, not just talking sports, but schools themselves, the cost of going to college is rising faster than inflation is rising. Eventually, this bubble is going to burst. But for now, as long as that value of school keeps going up, or the price of school, rather, who knows how much the value is. But if the price keeps going up and athletes are still on scholarship, somebody could argue technically, well, hey, you're actually getting more because the cost went up and you're still on scholarship. And you still don't have to pay it. So as for the actual numbers and how this could be broken down, again, that's a deep dive into the data that I ain't doing. If you want to do it, you do it and you put it on your podcast. And number three, how could the players get paid? They had to create leverage until they have leverage and the players are not going to get paid. Now, there are a thousand different ways leverage could be created. Uh, hopefully other people have ideas, people who are more bought in on this topic than even I am. But until there is leverage, nothing's going to happen. The G League has started to create some leverage for players, actually, inadvertently. The G League did this. Actually, they're trying to serve themselves by saying, hey, let us get access to these highly rated players who are going to go to the NBA anyway. They didn't do it because they're trying to fight the NCAA. They did it because they're trying to help themselves. But inadvertently, it creates a little bit of leverage for the players who are coming out of high school because now they have options. Instead of only having the NCAA as their only option, when someone has a monopoly on options, then they can do whatever they want because what else you going to do? You ain't got no other choice. It's like you want to put video on the Internet and get seen. You got to go through YouTube. They have no competitors. What other options do you have? So they could do whatever they want. But when options pop up, even two options, now you have some leverage. You can leverage the fact that you have more than one option against, you can leverage those options against each other and kind of get people to actually get into a, a bidding war if you are good enough. Again, the open market tells you how much you are actually worth. So these are the things that have to be kept in mind when we talk about should college athletes be paid. Now, when people are talking, making more of an emotional or a moral argument, um, this is not the show for that. This is not the show for emotional, uh, moral, who's right and who's wrong arguments because we could go back and forth all day about who's emotionally right and who is emotionally or morally correct or not correct. I just talked about that in episode 1782. Hurt feelings are a weapon in the emotional Olympics. I don't play in the emotional Olympics. We talk logic and facts here. 
and I just laid them out for you. So that's where I'm at. You tell me what you think. Send me a text. I should have told you at the top of the episode. Send me a text. Let me know the most valuable insight that you got from today's episode or something you want to challenge me on, something you want to question. Send me a text number 305-384-6894. Once again, 305-384-6894. Work on your game. Dre all day.